So this is the second is official, the second official. Is it going? Episode. It is going. This is the second official episode of the uh, Saxophone Performance Podcast, and I'm joined today by Dr. Frederick L. Hemke. Who's beginning to wake up a little bit. <laughs> Who's, uh, yeah, regaining consciousness after uh, a grueling day filled with <laughs> talks and more talks and teaching and more talks. And a little music. And a little bit of music in there. <laughs> so, the whole point of this show is to get the perspectives of, I'm hoping, many, many different saxophones. And yeah, so, I, I'm sure. And I'm, I'm, I really just want the audience to know basically your story. And if you would, wouldn't mind starting from the beginning, talking about how you were. How long is this interview? <laughs> We can go until no, the jazz can. concert, no, or we no, can do no. one hour. We did or an hour with Marcus earlier. We don't. Yeah, you did a whole hour with Marcus. Yeah, I just I said a He's couple a of questions. Talker, right, yeah. bro. <laughs> it was not difficult. Uh, no, 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 uh -uh. no. So uh, there is no beginning. <laughs> it just keeps going. It's a, a continuum. And I guess uh, I can't recall there being a beginning. So, so that'll make a challenge for you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can uh, recall your first experiences <laughs> no. with the saxophone. Oh, I can't. I can't even. Uh, can't even do that. Hmm. Uh, mm -mm. I do know that. My dad, who was a super athlete, played saxophone when he was in high school. Mm -hmm. And why he played saxophone, I simply do not know. But he had a uh, nickel-plated, which I still have, nickel-plated Holton mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in the attic. And I discovered that. Probably, uh, and I said probably because I just don't remember, really, uh, when I was 10 years old. Now, why 10? Uh, because I remember starting in a band program in the fourth grade. And fourth graders, I think, were 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So maybe it wasn't 10, but that's what I remember. And in the place where I lived, which was at the time an annex to the city of Milwaukee, the southern annex, which at the time was called the Town of Lake, had a renowned grade school band, mm. uh, had its own uniforms, had a reputation of uh, really fine making of music and a program that involved lots and lots of kids. So I joined the band, even though I think my dad would rather have had me get involved with athletics, but I did join the band and that's when I started. So the band director also taught everybody uh, how to play musical, the instrument that they chose. So for a long time, I was taught by the band director, whose name was Anthony Erickson. And uh, so it went. Uh, we, we marched uh, Memorial Day and every major uh, holiday during the summer. And then we gave concerts during the year. And I knew lots of kids through that including the entire saxophone section. I think I probably started on uh, either tenor or baritone, although I had my dad's alto. Hmm. I don't think this is much of an interview. You're not saying anything. <laughs> I'm letting you fill in well, the story. Well, I know, I know, you know story. Really need to all the work here. <laughs> right. uh, I'm not sure I want to do all of, all of that. Okay, so... But, but at any rate, so uh, graduated from there into high school. Right. 
And the kids that, that they all the, all the kids went to the same high school, but I was in the city of Milwaukee, and there were lots of good players in this grade school band. Uh, lots of good players. Some of them became lifelong friends, as a matter of fact. And some good saxophone players uh, who constantly uh, offered a challenge to uh, to get better in order to uh, play as well as they did. So in high school, a lot of them came along also. The high school band director uh, also was well known. Probably in the city of Milwaukee, the Bayview High School Band was the best band in the land. Mm. And he... The director uh, believed in uh, competition, but not the band. The band didn't compete. He believed in internal competition. So uh, every single rehearsal, uh, he encouraged all of us, not just saxophones, everybody, to challenge the person next to you uh, that was one up to see, to see that you could move up in the ranks. Uh, and that became uh, a, a question of uh, forcing you to practice, forcing you to learn, because as soon as you got to the top, were the first alto or first trumpet or whatever, uh, the next day the guy was going to, or gal, was going to challenge you. Uh, in my case, there were a lot of gals that played very, very well who wanted to be in the first position. But I challenged all the way up from the bottom when I got there as a freshman and then remained on top with few exceptions, although I'm sure that there were days when I lost and had to go back down. But boy, I wasn't going to let that happen. Mm -hmm. wouldn't last long. Uh, no, it wouldn't last long if it did happen. So I, I played first alto, then I became a soloist with him. Eventually I became uh, the band's drum major mm -hmm. and uh, increased in my uh, desire to play my dad's horn. It got to the point uh, where I had to get a new horn. I should just back up. In grade school, they did the school did enter a uh, contest, both... And the Wisconsin had a tremendous system of uh, 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 competitions that was done on a local level and then a state level. My wife did it on flute just like I, I did uh, on saxophone, uh, where you get medals for first, second, third. Uh, but, the, but the grade school was uh, really in, into that. So uh, I started off, as I said, on my dad's Holton, and then by eighth grade, uh, the horn simply couldn't do what needed to be done in order to win the contest at state. So I got a new saxophone, a Con Constellation. Brilliant horn. It's great. And then I went to high school and they didn't have competitions. Uh, they just had competitive in the band, but they didn't enter any, any state or local competitions. None of that. And uh, must have been about uh, maybe a junior when I ran out of that horn also and got a summer. And uh, that was a balanced action. And I kept that horn until um, well, I, I, uh, I went to Paris with, uh, with that horn. So I kept it for for a long time. Right. So during this time, were there any private teachers or were you instructed by the band director? Band director in grade school. Mm -hmm. uh, in high school, didn't have an instructor for a while, but there was a, uh, another band director who, Tony Erickson, who was in grade school, played all the instruments. He taught all, everybody in the band. But so I was looking for a saxophone teacher, and there was a band director way on the other side of town, North Division High School. And I found out that he directed the uh, high school band at North Division High School and uh, lived way, way up there. So there, 
he was willing to take me as a student, and then I would take the streetcar from way on the south side, uh, because Town of Lake, as I mentioned, was a south suburb, and then I would take the streetcar all the way to the north. That was hour and a half, two hour streetcar ride to get up there. I had a lesson at his home, Eddie Schmidt was his name, Edwin Schmidt, and he also directed the Miller High Life Company Band. Uh, had a professional band uh, made up of really fine Milwaukee professional musicians. Uh, and after a couple of years of, of teaching, uh, of his teaching me, uh, he asked me to join the band. He was the director of the band also. And so I, for a long time, I had the Miller High Life band uniform, <laughs> and we would go throughout, run around through the state playing concerts. And oftentimes I, I went along as uh, not only a member of the band, but as soloist also. Good experiences. So I, by the time I was ready to go to college, I already had a lot of competition behind me, mm -hmm. uh, either personal or the ensemble or whatever. Uh, and then my folks uh, never went to college. My aunt did, but I simply didn't know anything about it. My dad never went to college uh, because my grandfather didn't believe that he should go to college. His, he believed that his daughter should go to college, but not his son, which is kind of interesting. Right. Uh, so when I decided to go to college, there was no incentive to go any place except the local, local university, which was Milwaukee State Teachers College, or when I went there, it was uh, Wisconsin, Wisconsin State College, soon to become, after I think my sophomore year, it became the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. Uh, they didn't have anybody to teach saxophone there either. There was nobody teaching saxophone, really. Uh, but they had the clarinet guy uh, who who uh, took the saxophone students, but he understood that he was not a, a, a saxophone player. So I became the drum major of uh, a rinky-dink uh, band at UWM, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and uh, the guy who directed it was the clarinet teacher. Uh, in other words, he was my saxophone teacher, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, he and I would concoct great programs for this marching band. Uh, I mean, it was extraordinary what we, what we really did. Uh, so in my junior year, I still had been taking lessons once in a while from Eddie Schmidt. Uh, and he had a record collection uh, that in included uh, Marcel Mute. That's the first time I had heard of him. Mm -hmm. uh, my own record collection consisted of uh, Freddie Gardner, who was an English saxophonist of uh, popular music. And after I heard Mew, I decided, well, that's where the saxophone is headed. And uh, so I wrote to him uh, at the conservatory, just an open letter, I mean, no address, just Paris Conservatory, mm -hmm. and got in, in correspondence with him and uh, so it goes. So it goes. So with your experiences with the Miller High Life Band and mm. Edwin Schmidt's mm -hmm. marching band, no. I think it, what kind of music were you playing? Uh, the bands, the Milwaukee system, school system, was a fantastic uh, system. It based on old German uh, pedagogy uh, from all the way through in every subject. Uh, very strict but uh, v making sure that uh, in music it was included into the curriculum. They had a great orchestra program, a great band program, as I said. I think Bayview was the best in the city, but still, uh, every high school had a band program, mm -hmm. orchestra program, choral program, and then they had all city meetings, all city bands, all city orchestras, all city choruses, so you had hundreds and hundreds of kids from Milwaukee that were involved. Uh, and it was just, it, I, it never bothered my dad that I wasn't in athletics because I was part of a team. Uh, the team was all music. 
right. everybody in the city did something in music based on that old German tradition. <clears throat> uh, so they also had uh, Saturday lessons for anybody free um, just to teach them how to how to play and be better in their own high school. So they came all over from all over the city on Saturdays. Uh, because I was good, uh, I became a teacher in that, in that program. Uh, and, and more. <laughs> did you end up hearing back from Marcel Mule? Yeah, I did. Uh, he wrote, wrote back in French and uh, he was kind of amazed that I wrote to him. But he said, I can't promise you anything. If you want to study with me, you have to come here and come to Paris and uh, try out for uh, for uh, for lessons. <laughs> so I did. I borrowed 500 bucks from my parents and 500 bucks from my grandparents and uh, booked a, uh, a place on the SS United States and took off. How old were you at this point? Uh, 20. 20? Yeah. Okay. And I had never been away from home, but that didn't make any difference. So I got over there and uh, I had studied French before I went, studied during the summer, before I left and thought I knew French pretty well. Um, had a good background in Spanish before that, mm -hmm. and so it wasn't difficult to transfer. But when I got over to Paris, of course, nobody spoke French. They all spoke colloquial French, and uh, I was completely lost. Uh, so it took a little bit, but I, I didn't have any place to stay. Didn't have any idea where I was going to stay, much less any place to practice. So the first thing I did was call, call up Mule, and in then I would say my broken French, uh, because I certainly wasn't as good in French as I thought I was. Mm -hmm. uh, but he helped me uh, set up uh, a temporary space, at least with a friend of his who had an open room. And so I stayed at, the, at his friend's house for about two weeks while I went out and hunted for a place uh, to live. I found an apartment that was uh, uh, with an old, uh, not an old, but a woman who was an artist, and she was renting one of her rooms. So I stayed there. It was close to the conservatory, uh, within walking distance. Uh, I didn't have any place to practice, but I did uh, uh, go over to the conservatory. There was no place to practice there either, but I, I found an empty room, and so you toodle a little bit, and then I... Uh, uh, met Mueller and played for him, and bless his soul, uh, the class at the conservatory is comprised of 12 students, uh, and he accepted me as a member of his class, which was really nifty. Uh, there always has been a place étranger, a foreigner's place, mm -hmm. uh, but he didn't, he didn't put me in the place étranger. Uh, that was a limited place, a limited uh, opportunity. You couldn't be part of the class, but you could come in and observe once in a while and have a lesson once in a while. But I became a member of the class of 12 and uh, started to go to lessons at the conservatory. Uh, and we would meet three times a week for four hours each. And then every student, because we're 12 students, every student got an hour lesson with me. And it was never the, the same room, usually the same, but not always, because Mule did not have a studio. He just came in the morning or, uh, of the class, and he was assigned a big room, a large room, for, uh, for the four hours that he was there. Right. And you're implementing the same system here at camp, Trying it was to. it was everybody in the group lesson right three times a week 
Yeah. So everybody heard everybody and heard what the teacher had to say. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, it, it, you know, it's impossible in our educational system to have, uh, especially at collegiate level, mm. to have a block of time, four hours, uh, for uh, for 12 students three times a week. Uh, universities don't run that way. Mm -hmm. But here, at least we uh, have a chance to get together for three hours with uh, 10 of our students. Uh, the, the class at Snow Pond is 20, mm -hmm. uh, no more, just 20 or five quartets. And we just divided the class down right in half. Uh, so I'd see, we'd see 10 at a time for three hours uh, together. And students would play for each other and then receive critique from, uh, from us and also open up for discussion any questions, any criticism from the class itself. And it was the same at the Paris Conservatory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You were able to mm -hmm. offer criticism. That's great. Yep. So what, what stuck out about Marcel Mule's teaching? What, was, what were some principles that, that he taught the students? Well, the the, uh, the students were all good students because they had come from local conservatories. Mm -hmm. the uh, The conservatory of Paris is called the Superior, uh, but there are and so that's where everybody, regardless of what instrument they play, tries to reach. Paris and the Paris Conservatory. Bordeaux has a conservatory, there's one at Le Mans, there's one at Dijon, they're all over the place, but those are all local conservatories. So they have the same system, that is you win a prize, or you win your prizes, and on the basis of that, then you can compete for one of the spots, one of the, uh, saxophone or any of the instruments, one of the 12 spots in the class. So the kids that were my classmates that were there were pretty doggone good players uh, as as well, and uh, that made it interesting uh, too because it likewise is it was a competitive situation, but everybody knew that they were good players and so they helped they helped each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so with no practice rooms. And well, okay, so after I finally got a place to stay, right. then I really started to look around to find out what uh, people did. Uh, it's frowned upon to play in, uh, in an apartment building filled mm -hmm. with, with people. They don't want to hear saxophone or anything. So generally speaking, you cannot practice in a room. Uh, I, I went over to the uh, American church in Paris. There are two of those. This one's on Quai d'Orsay, and found out that they had a room way, way back in the church that wasn't being used. And they let me stay back there uh, because I wouldn't bother anybody, and I could practice. It was stifling hot most of the time, but it was a practice spot. So that became my practice spot. I just mm -hmm. spent a lot of time shedding uh, back in that little room of the American Church of Paris. How long were you in Paris? From uh, September, either August or September, I think it must have been September, until uh, the following July. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you tell us in lessons that you, when you were at the Paris Conservatory, you practiced eight hours a day? Well... Then... Yeah, you didn't have to practice anymore after that. Uh, well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I figured that was enough practice. Right. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I, I know. I always tell my students that they have to practice because they have to. But I'm not a great lover of practice. Mm -hmm. I, I do it because, and I did it for years, uh, because it's an absolute necessity that you practice. But it was never one of my favorite things to do. Uh, I enjoyed performing, mm -hmm. but I didn't enjoy woodshedding every single day all over Paris I have done my I paid my dues right of course <laughs> and this this have this year just happened to line up with the concours where uh, Alfred Dixon Clover wrote the yeah, yeah right there was every every year there's a concours right uh, but this year happened to be the year that Dixon Clover was commissioned to uh, write the concours piece 
for the final examination. Mm -hmm. And uh, as it happened, it turned out to be a pretty good piece. Some of those conservatory pieces are not very, uh, very good, actually. Uh, but this was a good one, mm -hmm. and uh, as is evidenced by the fact that for many years it it has been on uh, contest international contest lists, uh, along with other standards. So it has become almost a, a standard in itself. It's well written. It's a good piece of music, and it's uh, not easy. Right. Yeah. Uh, I had a chance to meet Desan Clo because he was a, a member of the jury. Uh, that adjudicated the final exam uh, and uh, talked talked with him and uh, gained his insights into into the piece of music as well. So he liked the way I played it. Uh, I think I think I had mentioned to you that there were two first prizes that year, mm -hmm. myself and uh, uh, another one of the other students. And then everybody else either got a second prize or a third prize or an honorable mention. Uh, those that didn't get a first prize normally were encouraged to come back another year and try again. Sometimes they got a first prize, sometimes they did not. Some of them never got a first prize. So after an entire year of grinding, eight hours a day, in yeah. the American church, yeah. you got your first prize in uh, the concours, yeah. and then... You just come back to America? Well, I had, yes, that's exactly what right. I did. Uh, I had by that time had met the Selmers, mm -hmm. uh, Maurice, and the, the old ones. Pat, Patrick at the time was, was just a young kid for crying out loud. Mm. Uh, but I met him also. But I met his dad and his uncle and all the Selmer, Selmer people. Uh, and uh, they referred me to the Selmer people in the United States. So yes, I, I think I visited my relatives in Sweden. Uh, I still had some money left out of my thousand bucks. Uh, I, I should mention that the pastor at the American church in Paris, uh, he didn't do anything illegal, I don't think, <laughs> but uh, he, he periodically would take his American dollars he was an American citizen, and would go to uh, Switzerland mm -hmm. and uh, uh, exchange his money on the black market in in Switzerland. So my thousand uh, dollars, once he encouraged me to do that, <laughs> my thousand dollars increased right. in, in great value uh, to the to the point where I was able to uh, buy a soprano saxophone uh, while I was over there as well. Uh, Mule's wife had a little business on the side mm. of selling instruments and reeds and, and that kind of thing. So I bought the instrument from her. It was a Mark VI crown at this point? I think it was a balanced action. Balanced action. I, I think so, if I can remember. I still have it, but uh, I, I, I don't play it uh, okay. any, any longer. Uh, the one that I played was... Uh, a Mark VI, mm -hmm. and, I, and then eventually I got a Series Two also. Yes, yeah, so you only alluded to the black market thing on your 80th birthday, so I'm glad we're, not, we're, we're able we're, to address that. Well, <laughs> have that cut on that, record. Cut that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, but everybody did. That. Oh, of course, everybody did that in, in, in those days. The American Church in Paris also was a billeting service for GIs who. Uh, they had a huge gymnasium, which they just lined up with cots. Mm -hmm. uh, and the GIs who were on leave or had free time would come to Paris, and they had no place to stay. So they were billeted then at the American church uh, in Paris. Uh, one of my side jobs in the evening, after I got to know the people in the church, of course, was to take the, uh, the GIs on tours night tours of uh, Paris. By that time I knew the city pretty well, so mm -hmm. we would go up to Pigalle and uh, the nightclubs up there, and I would show them around and uh, where to go, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> and got paid a, a small amount of money for, for doing that, but that, that was fine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> my apartment, uh, apartment, my room, at that time I had moved to uh, another place uh, 
just to, because it was a little bit cheaper and, and it was nice, but it didn't have a shower. So I would take all my showers uh, at the American Church in Paris, where they had the billeting service. They also provide a shower service for the GIs. So we finished the year in France, yeah. and then you come back to the United States. Mm -hmm. When did college education enter the picture? Or? Well, I had been two by that time. I had been in my junior. I would, would have been my junior, junior year in college. Okay. Um, so I went back and finished finished my uh, undergraduate degree in music education, mm -hmm. and then taught for two years in public school music as a junior high school band director, and then decided I needed to uh, to move on. Went to the Eastman School, tried tried for the. I I should say that I had heard of other schools when I was looking before I went to UWM, but couldn't have possibly afford to go to any mm -hmm. of those schools. And I think my tuition at UWM was about $90 a year, and that included books. So my parents, who had never gone to college, as I mentioned, thought that was, that was too much money, uh, even that. But I managed to... Uh, at least go to UWM and, and uh, finish my teaching degree there before I went out and taught in junior high school. Uh, <laughs> so I had heard of uh, the Eastman School mm -hmm. and was contacted by Freddie Fennell. Uh, and uh, he wanted to know if I'd like to come and play in the Eastman with us. So, so I thought, well... I didn't know anything about colleges at all, or I didn't know anything about the Eastman School, except I had heard recordings of the Wind Ensemble. So what the heck? Right. So my wife, by that time I was married, my wife and I went out to Eastman and spent uh, two years out there because I had, I completed my master's degree in music education and then started a doctorate. Uh, but in the, in the, Second year of of uh, Eastman, uh, with the encouragement of Selmer, uh, I made my New York debut in Town Hall. And it's interesting. My wife just while I've been been here at camp, she sent me a, a, a she was going through all kinds of stuff at home, and came across the telegram that the dean at Northwestern had sent me about four days after I gave my uh, town hall recital, and four days after the uh, reviews had come out in the New York papers. Mm. Uh, Benny Goodman was at my recital, uh, so was Sigurd Rasher, and so was Sonny Rollins. Well, now, what in the world were they doing there? <laughs> uh, well, they were, they were there because they all knew the Selmers, and oh. because the Selmers were instrumental in promoting me to, to do the recital, uh, they contacted their their friends, and uh, so Goodman and Sigurd and Sonny were all summer summer people, and and the uh, lots of other people also. Right. I mean, those are the three notables that I I remember, and I got good reviews. So four days after, a very simple uh, letter, a telegram came asking if I'd like to teach at Northwestern. And I didn't have anything uh, cooking, uh, so I finished the, the uh, second year while I was beginning the doctoral program. Just left and never did finish my doctorate there. Eventually, I finished it. Uh, I did it at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. So I went and got and took the job. I found out when I got there it was a, a part-time job. Mm -hmm. uh, my predecessor had been Cecil Leeson, and he retired. And they were looking for a saxophone teacher. So on the uh, on the advice basically of John P. Painter, and why John? Uh, during the time I was at Eastman, I was and with the help of Selmer again, I was constantly on the road on weekends. I'd take classes during the week and then leave Friday afternoon and uh, give a clinic and uh, give a solo performance someplace in the United States. It was all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, Summer had representatives out in the field, and uh, 
they would call out and say, hey, would you like to come out and play with this band at the high school, at the college? Where Sure, right. Uh, I did those gigs for $75 plus expenses and uh, did that all through the time I was at Isla mm -hmm. and got a lot of experience uh, working th that way and just dropped all of that stuff and, and took the job at Northwestern, continued going out on, on weekends uh, because it was a part-time position and I could use uh, the couple hundred bucks that I would make. Uh, sometimes I would do two or three appearances a day, all within a similar vicinity that uh, the summer reps set up, uh, but did those as well as taught part-time because I only had, uh, when Cecil retired, he didn't have many students left. I mm -hmm. think I only had two, two or three students. I recruited some uh, right from Northwestern, uh, Jimmy D. Pasquale uh, was one of, one of my first, if not my first student. I had contacted a number of, of potential students while I was out on the road giving clinics and, and being solos and uh, contacted them and, and enticed them to come to Northwestern. And so eventually, within the year that I was there, hmm. That was 1962, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, within the year, I talked to the dean and said, uh, you know, it's rather, it's not so easy living here when you're just working part time. Mm -hmm. he, and so I, I, he, was, he was fine. He said, well, uh, we, can, we can use you if you can teach uh, harmony, theory, theory, ear training, and sightseeing. That, that wasn't a, a big deal for me. I had studied that at Eastman, of course. And so I said, well, fine. So I got a full-time position as an instructor, um, teaching theory, ear training, and sight singing, and saxophone. And then I was able, within the next two years, to really do a tremendous amount of recruiting. And a lot of that had to do with, I, with the fact that I was still going out on weekends, mm -hmm. meeting a lot of saxophonists in high school, uh, good players, and recruiting them to come to, uh, to Northwestern. So after two years of theory, ear training, sight singing, which I enjoyed, it was fine, uh, but I had a big enough class uh, that I didn't have to do that. And uh, then I was quickly promoted to assistant professor. Uh, I took the initiative at that point, uh, the Organization for Winds and Percussion Instruments at Northwestern didn't exist. They had a department of strings, but they had nothing for winds and percussion. So I talked the dean into allowing me to be the chair of uh, the winds and percussion uh, department, newly formed. Mm -hmm. uh, so I formed the thing, got, got it all organized, and uh, we were off and running. Uh, uh, with the help of Wally Kujawa, who was uh, uh, who had just joined the faculty from Chicago Symphony, mm -hmm. we made a curriculum, uh, including technique and repertoire, put all of that in place, and we had a standardized way of uh, treating all the instruments in the department. I then started a prep department, which again they had in piano and strings, but not in winds. Uh, hired a faculty uh, for that and uh, started to recruit kids into the prep department who then fed in to the rest of the, the rest of the university. So I was soon promoted to associate professor mm -hmm. and uh, that went well, got a really good class, some very strong, strong players, formed a quartet. Uh, kept in touch with Mule all that time, sent him recording, see what he thought of it. He, uh, he was very encouraging uh, <laughs> with all of that. And I uh, had been there for about not that I, I'm trying to think of, of what, what I did, but I found out that the, that the State Department the U.S. State Department had a cultural exchange program uh, and 
Well, yes, I, I, I do re remember a little bit about, about that. Uh, found out that you could apply with an ensemble to be part of the cultural exchange program. Uh, and I had been going to a summer camp out in Gunnison, Colorado, uh, in interesting camp. Uh, it was a band camp, but the director envisioned a band that was like an orchestra. So hired musicians like uh, Bill Bell and Arnold Jacobs on tuba, uh, great trombonists and brass players from uh, Cleveland and Philadelphia and the Chicago Symphony who would come out and play in a band with special arrangements that sounded like a real orchestra and got to know those guys. Uh, one of the directors was uh, Bill Ravelli. And I got to know Bill, uh, not as a student, but as a colleague. And Bill was uh, in, involved with the, as a, uh, um, a person that reviewed the uh, applications for cultural exchange programs for for the uh, uh, government, mm -hmm. and uh, I had already applied, and he knew he found out about it, and so he he uh, he put in the good work. <laughs> you were a shoo in. I was a shoo in, <laughs> absolutely. So I, I took uh, our my quartet uh, on a uh, three month tour of uh, the Far East. That's where they sent us to the Far East, and we were there for three months. I went a little bit early earlier than the rest of, uh, actually I took five, five members, one is an alternate and a pianist mm -hmm. uh, along. And I went a little bit earlier to do, to be the soloist with the New Zealand uh, Philharmonic, the NZBC, the New Zealand Philharmonic Orchestra, played, uh, oh my goodness, what did I, well I played the Glossop, if I remember that, and, mm -hmm. uh, and something else, gave a couple of concerts before everybody else uh, 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 arrived, uh, and during that tour, I had a play, I had an opportunity to be soloist with the Korean Philharmonic, mm -hmm. the Japan Philharmonic. Um, was that, uh, with, uh, was huh? that with uh, Seiji? Was that one? No, it was not with Seiji. It was oh, right. This was a this, this was a radio Tokyo. orchestra in oh, uh, okay. in Tokyo. Uh, got to know Seiji, but that was right. That was later. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. So that's a uh, that's my brief history. Have you ever seen that program? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well. <laughs> I'll look it up later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, man. Well, yeah. we, I have to back up a little bit. All right, so, back up. <laughs> you, you finished your doctorate at UW-Milwaukee? Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, I didn't. I finished it at Madison. Madison. Mo uh, Milwaukee at the time did not have a doctorate okay. program. Madison. Now, how did I get that? Right. Uh, well... <laughs> Uh, while I was teaching at Northwestern, I, uh, being an old Wisconsin uh, boy myself, I was born and raised in Milwaukee, uh, I, I noticed that they had no saxophone. You've you got to remember in, that back in those days, there were no saxophone teachers anywhere. Right. Uh, Larry Teal was the closest that, that came to that, and he had a studio in Detroit. Uh, he taught students in the studio in Detroit, and he also taught part-time at uh, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Eventually, he also became full-time, similar to my, myself in that, in that regard. But you either went to, uh, you either went to Michigan uh, or you went to Cecil Leeson in uh, Northwestern. There was no place to go. Uh, Iowa had a good program with Jaime Voxman, uh, but that was a woodwind. Uh, Jaime was a clarinetist. But uh, they taught saxophone mm -hmm. there, and you could get a degree in woodwinds at uh, uh, Iowa. And then there was nothing. Uh, Gene Rousseau at the time uh, was teaching, but he was an oboist. In fact, he's a Northwestern guy. Uh, he got his undergrad there, uh, and maybe even a master's, I can't remember. Yeah. But he was teaching oboe at uh, Luther College. Uh, there, there was no saxophone uh, teacher, so I I found out that uh, there was no mystery uh, that Wisconsin did not have a saxophone teacher. So I decided to go up there and talk to their 
their, uh, it wasn't the dean, it was the chair of the music department, and say, listen, you got to have a saxophone uh, teacher here, and I'll be it. Uh, so uh, every Monday, every Monday, uh, for a number of years, I would leave Northwestern and drive up to Madison, teach all day, and uh, and then come come back uh, to uh, Evanston, where at the time we were we were living in Evanston, mm -hmm. uh, and got some awfully good students up there. Also recruited several of them, as a matter of fact, to Northwestern. Um, and I still hear from, from those kids also. Uh, Dave Hastings uh, married one of my students, originally married one of my students from, from Madison. Mm. Uh, but th that, was, that was fun. I, I really enjoyed building that program while I was building the program at, uh, at Northwestern. Uh, after, I took, after I took the, uh, the quartet, Quintet, actually, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to the Far East. So when I got back, they promoted me to full professor. Wow. Uh, and I still did not have, I don't think, my doctorate at that point, but that's when I decided that I really needed and wanted that degree. So uh, at that point, I had been teaching at Wisconsin. I knew the faculty there, and I knew the chair, and the chair approached approached me because I was going to take a year off and go back to Eastman and finish my doctorate at Eastman where right. I had started. And he said, well, why don't you come here? Oh, I said, that's great, but uh, <laughs> you don't have a saxophone teacher other than me. He said, oh, well, don't worry about, about that. You can teach yourself. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I, I decided to go to, uh, to Wisconsin, not to study saxophone, but to get the degree. Mm -hmm. So I took all of the coursework uh, for a doctorate and uh, didn't take any lessons. But I spent time with the clarinet teacher mm -hmm. just because he was a good guy and uh, he liked saxophone. Uh, we'd play quartets and stuff, things like, like that. And uh, uh, I... It, I think I uh, eventually I got a sabbatical leave, the one sabbatical leave I had at Northwestern, and uh, took the family and and went up to uh, a, a suburb outside of Madison and lived there for a year while I did all of the coursework, and then started my dissertation, which took a couple of years uh, because of research. Of course. And, well, you know how that goes. <laughs> And uh, and got my and, and eventually I think I, I can't remember seventy six I think I got my uh, finished all the, everything there was to do and uh, got got the degree and they had a very good library up there uh, I, when I was oh, off of after my year of residence uh, and was off of campus I took a big advantage of the Newberry Library down in, in Chicago. I also spent some time at the University of Chicago, which has got an excellent library also. And of course, Northwestern, uh, all, all of them. And then I, I took, uh, during the summer, one summer I went to uh, Paris and uh, worked at the Bibliothèque Nationale, which has got all the, the best stuff in the world when it comes to saxophone and did a lot of research there. And then started to write and spent a, a goodly amount of my my life while well, my wife took care of our kids. Uh, every single night down in the basement, writing, writing, doing research, going through all that stuff that uh, we all have to go through. Uh, but uh, it, it was a worthwhile project. I, I really enjoyed it. So after I had the degree, uh, then I lobbied at Northwestern to have a degree in winds, a, a doctoral degree in, in winds. Uh, and uh, the faculty fought me on that for a while, but uh, I prevailed, in, including a degree in saxophone, of course. So we were really a very early program. Uh, I, I, I don't think there were any others uh, that had a doctorate in saxophone uh, except, uh, except Northwestern. Well, that, uh, that's the way she goes. Uh, uh, it had its pluses and its minuses. Uh, I know the year that we that I took 
the three months that I was gone, you will appreciate this, the three months that I was gone on tour for the State Department, I convinced my wife to uh, meet me in Japan after the tour, uh, and that took some doing. So she left my son and daughter, my daughter, sorry, I didn't have a son then, my daughter with my mom and dad in Milwaukee while she flew to Japan. And we were gone a good month, so the whole trip, I was away about four months. Mm. And when I came back, we went to pick up my daughter in Milwaukee, and she didn't know me. Oh, my gosh. And that was one of the hardest things I think I have ever gone through. She would have absolutely nothing to do with me. She just didn't know me. <sighs> Took a long time to rebuild that confidence. And uh, frankly, I'm not sure I ever did really ever uh, get her complete confidence again. Uh, because as a teacher and as a performer, I was gone so much of the time. As I said to you, every single weekend I, mm -hmm. I would be out on the road. And when I was working on my dissertation, it was every night down in the basement writing. So my wife, bless her soul, really, uh, really did the family work. Yeah. And so that everything becoming well-known, uh, getting the degree, uh, earning a professorship at the university, all of those things along we have a, have a cost. And in my case, uh, the, the, the cost was really lack, lack of contact with my kids. Uh, it took a long time. I mean, my relationship is fine. It's not that. But you can sense yes. that they didn't like it. Uh, uh, it, 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 was, it was really very difficult. But I had such high aspirations for the saxophone uh, that I felt it just had to be done. So I did it, and, uh, and as I said, you sacrifice some things in the process of working out your ideals. That's the way life goes. Well, it's, it's, it seems similar to the biography of Adolf Sachs, because after I read your dissertation, yeah. it, oh. it occurred to me that this man really worked yeah. tirelessly yeah, to get did. his instrument out there, and, yeah, and yeah. then you were in Paris going through newspaper clippings oh, and all yeah. the biographies, all in French, and, yeah. and then wrote the paper basically on him and the creation of his instrument. Yeah, it's like, uh, it's almost the spirit of saxophone that we all have to kind of well, struggle yeah, and sacrifice. It, 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 we do. Yeah. Uh, anyone who's, who has gone out and, and uh, performed will, will testify to the, uh, the kind-hearted people that come up after a concert, after a recital, and say, gee, I've never heard a saxophone like that before. Uh, the second question is inevitably, do you play jazz, mm -hmm. or uh, what do you what do you do uh, for a living? Uh, I play the sax. Oh, the saxophone! You're a jazz musician. Now I love jazz. It's not that, but I've always tried to show the other side of the saxophone and be the proponent for the classical saxophone. It's not that I don't appreciate. Uh, or uh, don't admire jazz musicians, I do, very much so. And I've had a lot of really good students who have become jazz musicians. Ron Blake, Ron Blake who's teaching at who's Snowpon. teaching up, uh, up at Snowpon right now, is a prime example, and he's not alone. I've had a lot of musicians that have turned out... Uh, Bunky, uh, Bunky Green. Bunky Green, yep. David Bunky Sanborn. David Sanborn, yeah. and, and there have been many more. Of course. So uh, it, it's not that, but we still have work to do. Of course. Uh, I mean, you still get people that uh, think of the saxophone only in one regard, and that is as a dance band instrument or as a, uh, a jazz instrument. So you mentioned the audience that comes up to you after the recital. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking back to your town hall recital yeah. in New York City. What did Benny Goodman and Sonny Rollins have to say? 
after well, they, they, diplomatically, I guess they all they <laughs> all thought it was great. But you know, Benny Goodman uh, is a cla- He's a he's a classic yeah. in the terms of uh, played the Copeland uh, clarinet concerto, mm-hmm. and he's played the Mozart clarinet concerto, and still does, does his kind of jazz. Uh, Sonny uh, has become uh, over the years become uh, became a, a good good uh, buddy, a good friend, <laughs> who really also uh, was a great admirer of. Uh, uh, of Marcel Mew. Uh, uh, Paul Desmond, for example, had all of Mew's uh, recordings and thought that Mew was really a great player. So a good jazz musician isn't just strictly a jazz jazzer. Uh, these are intelligent musicians who appreciate music just like uh, we who appreciate jazz. Uh, it, it's the same thing. It, it's just that with saxophone. You can, you can have uh, a trumpet player and nobody says after you say well I'm a trumpet major nobody says oh you're a jazz musician right. they want to know well where do you play or what do you do same with clarinet uh, uh, oboist it doesn't have the same analogy of course but nobody would ask or a flutist uh, if they if they love jazz we still have a, uh, a way to go, I think, on saxophone, and that's what I always try to impress upon kids also. Uh, one of the, the, the real concerns I have with, with young saxophonists is they, they think it's all just gravy at this stage of the game. They don't have to put in, they don't have to put in their, uh, their licks. Right. Uh, it's going to drop into place for them. And of course, they're going to play uh, saxophone and classical saxophone and be a great soloist. It's uh, it's not that uh, that easy at all, and as I said, I've put in I've put in my time, and uh, it had its costs. Yes, but it also had its great benefits. Oh, it had its great benefits to be sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I've never never regretted it uh, at all, uh, and it's kept me young. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Young is in heart. I, that's all. It, it, nothing more than. than You'll be eighty three next next month. No, no, eighty two. Eighty two. Oh, okay. okay. Don't give me the eighty three. Oh, apologies. Yet. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to rush you. No, no, no. Uh, so, in your mind, what what can the future generation do to close that gap between the audience or uh, educating? Yeah. The greater public about the classical saxophone. Well. One thing they can do is, uh, we all can do, I think it's just become better educated in a liberal arts sense. Uh, for God's sake, you can't just play the saxophone. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I mean, I'm a great reader. Yes. And uh, I, I believe the saxophonists have to, have to be able to be a, a, a little bit smarter than everybody else. So you need, you need to have a sense of history. Uh, really, you need to have a sense of literature. You have to have a great sense of all of the arts, not just uh, not just music. You have to be able to transcend the saxophone per se. Saxophone for me is just a tool, uh, just a tool that I use because it's a beautiful instrument. Uh, it's a tool that I use to express who I am as an individual. For me, the great joy, of course, is when I. When you talk to musicians, other than saxophonists, we can talk about things other than saxophone, other than music for that matter. Uh, We can talk about art and philosophy and history. uh, And and that is something that younger saxophonists don't always appreciate, that they need to broaden themselves as individuals, not as saxophonists. So you can play... You can play uh, Caprice en forme de Vols faster than anybody else. You can play the uh, Eber while standing on your head. You can play a contemporary piece of, of music by uh, Babbitt or uh, 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 with all the notes in the perfect place. But that's not what the issue is. Uh, who are you as an individual? What have you got to say as a personality? What do you have to say as a musician? What do you know about Bach? Handle. What do you know about Mahler? What do you know about Beethoven? What do you know about anything? You really have to know intimately uh, where you sit in context of, of the art world. Uh, you should remember, I've always in, 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 
always ask students that because we live in the Chicago area, take time to go down and listen to the Chicago Symphony. Take time to go to the Chicago Art Institute. Look at art, read books, read philosophy. Uh, do something <clears throat> other than play the saxophone. Mm. Saxophone is lovely, but uh, you, you can't build your life and you can't build changing other people's opinion of the instrument by just playing saxophone. It's too limiting of a, of a perspective, uh, perspective uh, to, uh, to, to do that. It's necessary to really broaden your education uh, much more than is possible, and, but you got to work at it. <clears throat> so even if I spend four hours on my saxophone and then spend the rest of the time on my phone, yeah. I'm not. I, I'm not accomplishing what you're yeah, talking about. Absolutely not. No, no, no. I want a rounded personality. Uh huh. <clears throat> you know darn well that you had to work hard for your uh, for your degree, yes. and uh, that's because I wouldn't uh, wouldn't tolerate anything less than that. So you could play the saxophone well. That, that's great, <laughs> but that's not what I was interested in. I, no. And I, I I wanted you to be exactly what you turn out to be, a well-rounded guy who, person that can express themselves in, in an artistic sense and sit down with, uh, in conversation with anybody and be able to discuss. Uh, you had, you've talked to uh, Marcus and uh, you know he has a well-rounded... Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, he, well, you know, when he studied with me, I encouraged him because he's just that kind of a guy. Yeah. I, I encouraged him to take more courses in philosophy than in music. Mm -hmm. He knows his music and he loves philosophy. Yeah. So he did that. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's kept on with it uh, uh, as well. He has a better memory uh, for those things than I do. That's for darn sure. But he's an interesting guy to talk to, isn't yes, he? Absolutely. Yeah, right. That's, that's, <laughs> what we, man, that's, what we, that's what we need really need to do. That's what students need to do. If they're just saxophone players, they're nothing. So that's part one. You build the saxophones, you build the <clears throat> artists, you build the individual. Right. But then when you have this great artist, how does it then connect with the uh, greater public? What, what, do you, what, do you, what do you hope to see happen in the future? Yeah, well, uh, the saxophone is not going to be part of a symphony orchestra. Uh, there are pieces that we play in orchestra, uh, but my fear is not for the saxophone in the orchestra. My fear is for the orchestra. Mm -hmm. uh, it's become a mu almost a museum piece, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a whole different discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact of the of the matter is that this modern symphony orchestra does not play contemporary music. Uh, if they play a couple of pieces throughout their season in contemporary music, they're they're doing well, and a lot of symphonies don't even don't even do that. And you don't find saxophone in Beethoven, uh, or in Brahms, or in Schubert, or in Mahler. Uh, so where is it going to be? It's going to be in contemporary music if it's anywhere. Mm -hmm. And if we move beyond Bolero and pictures at an exhibition and and that, so I don't see it there as a, as a soloist. <clears throat> uh, for the very same reason that uh, the symphony is, is in trouble uh, financially uh, as well as philosophically, uh, conductors are not necessarily going to hire saxophone soloists uh, because they remain rather uh, conser not rather, very conservative, mm -hmm. and, and the stuff that we play is more av uh, avant-garde or at least contemporary. <clears throat> uh, a good composer will, uh, will pr if, if a good composer, uh, uh, a well-known composer writes a piece for saxophone, a concerto for saxophone, then you get a crack at it, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it's short-lived. It will not last very long. Uh, no matter what. So, from my standpoint of being a soloist, it's possible for a limited few. Uh, I, personally, I'm really in, engaged in 
and encouraging composers to write for uh, uh, saxophone in a chamber context. Um, uh, I really think that there's a future for saxophone in chamber music, mm -hmm. especially in when you join with other instruments. We talked about that a little bit uh, uh, today, but we have instruments that are accepted. Uh, I, for a long time, used to have a group, a woodwind quintet without a horn. I had a lot of arrangements that I had people make for me for flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, and saxophone. Mm -hmm. No horn, just a, a quintet of all woodwinds. <clears throat> uh, and if you can join in with other, what are, in quotes, accepted instruments, flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, violin, piano, uh, anything that has its own standards already set in terms of traditional classical music, even contemporary music, uh, especially in Europe, but even more so uh, lately in the United States, has a following. Mm -hmm. And people then associate the saxophone with being along with the other accepted instruments. And I think that there's a great possibility for saxophone in the, in that uh, genre. But let's see, you, you never, never know. I, I don't have a crystal ball to, to see what's going to happen, but I think there's a real strong possibility that saxophone could be a real advantage and achieve a certain amount of respect uh, in chamber music. Absolutely. And then we saw in your retirement, <clears throat> the, with the collective of all your former students coming together to yeah. create the commission right. uh, for the Hemke Concerto, Prisons of Light, yep. by Augusta Reed Thomas. Right. So what do you think about this model, and why, why isn't it happening more often? Well, for the, for the very same reason. She's a very fine composer. Uh, but there is a caveat. She's not that famous of a composer, and the symphony orchestras are uh, are not going to take a chance on someone like Augusta Reed Thomas. Uh, put her put it in, in the program, mm -hmm. uh, and that's unfortunate, but that's the way it goes. I know that I made a direct approach to Muti with Chicago Symphony to see if uh, he would uh, be interested in that? No. No, he would. Uh, maybe, maybe sometime later, but no, no, no. Uh-uh, it wasn't going to, it just wasn't going to be possible. Uh, and he prefers to play, uh, perform Italian music and mm. standards of literature. What is he afraid of? Well, he's afraid of the audience uh, rejecting it and not coming to hear him play conservative music. They're all old, like me, uh, and older. Mm. And uh, he needs to placate those people that support the symphony orchestra. Yeah, uh, I have tried very hard. Uh, we, we, I, did, I did perform it and record it with the... Uh, uh, New Haven Symphony Orchestra uh, on Nimbus, and I don't know if it'll be picked up by anybody. I do know that finally, after four years, uh, it is going to be reviewed formally in fanfare, uh, but that's only because of political pull that I have with some of the people that write reviews, mm. <clears throat> and that's also what it takes. I think I have sent that recording uh, along with a personal letter and recommendations to uh, uh, almost every single major symphony orchestra and minor symphony orchestra in the United States, uh, thinking that they, while they're planning for two years ahead, it would never be right now, but for two or three years ahead they would include uh, the concerto. Uh, no takers. So, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Uh, I don't know. Uh, we, we really have tried. It's a darn good recording with the New Haven Orchestra. They did a really fine job of it. And uh, I enjoyed that. But there are a lot of composers, including Marilyn Schroon, who do not get her works performed by orchestras.
it's a it's an economic political question more than artistic question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got nice, awfully nice letters back from all of all of the directors uh, commenting about the fine performance, but they're just not interested in putting it into their season uh, programming. And why uh, your guess is as good as mine, but I I. Blame, I guess, the fact that we have older audiences, not young audiences, who are providing the sustenance and providing the foundation financially for these orchestras. Mm -hmm. And as you know, a lot of orchestras over the last 10 years have folded. They're gone. Uh, some of them have come back reluctantly, but they're almost all outside of Chicago, uh, New York, uh, maybe Philadelphia or Boston, uh, who have big foundations in back of them. The rest of them are still dependent upon local uh, patrons. And when the patrons die, uh, things get scary yeah. for the orchestra. And sometimes they just have to collapse. I know that sounds really pessimistic, so I hope I'm wrong. Right. I, I really do. Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm encouraged because I see, at least with people in my age bracket, <clears throat> there's a lot of these smaller chamber groups like you described that's true that are coming up and that is encouraging saxophones are doing a lot of interesting things with mixed media and uh, combinations of the arts absolutely <clears throat> saxophone quartets have been doing very well saxophone quartets yep uh fish off uh, any number of competitions have come up with really good saxophone quartets that win prizes uh, so after you win the prize then what <laughs> <laughs> As is the problem with any chamber group, but yeah, uh, right, right. But chamber chamber music is becoming more popular. It's more intimate, and it's much more popular with young people. And economically, or just as a business, a lot less overhead, a lot less, a lot to deal less with. overhead. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. So as we uh, start winding down here, what yes. what oh, to all the. Well, let's do the young people. The yeah. young, the young, possibly in college, maybe in high school, considering studying saxophone. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for them? Oh, uh, the advice is exactly what you would expect. Work your buns off, become really good. You can't exist if you're going to be mediocre. Uh, you have to be better than everybody else, and then take advantage of every opportunity that comes and uh, say yes to anything. If it's playing the circus, say yes. <clears throat> when there was a circus, now you don't even have Barnum and Bailey anymore. <laughs> but uh, you, you want to make sure that uh, you go to your library, you go to your church, you go to your synagogue, <clears throat> you go to the uh, YMCA, you go to old retirement homes, uh, wherever you can, and perform. You got to get out and perform. Someplace along the line, someone is going to hear you and say, "Hey, this you got talent. Can I help you? Yeah. Can I help you move along?" Those things do happen, but they don't happen if you sit back and do nothing and wait for it to come to you because it won't come. So for young people, they have to be just as eager as I was when I was young. Uh, it doesn't work any other any other other way that I know of. <laughs> Maybe there are other ways, but I haven't seen it seen it happen. And you know, the only hope you've got now is that I'll die and uh, uh, somebody will take my place and, and off we go. I mean, when I retired from Northwestern, I thought that I would be able to have one of my own uh, students take my place. Uh, as it turned out, it didn't happen that way. Uh, the dean thought otherwise. Uh, so be it. Uh, but you. You, you got to put yourself in a position that when a position does open mm -hmm. at a university, you are prepared with your doctorate, with your background, with your experience, with your ability to perform, to be able to step in and be competitive for those jobs. And certainly they're political, there's no question about that, but uh, you, you got to be willing to put yourself in the position of, of being one of, the, one of the people that people are looking at. And... Uh, and go for it. Wise words. Wisdom, I don't know, but I think there's a brilliant feature for saxophonists 
like there is for flutists in that sense, or oboists, or clarinetists, or whatever, if you have persistence, if you have some vision, and if you're willing to do the dirty work that's necessary in order to move ahead. Um, my words of wisdom are don't expect anybody to give you golden apples. Uh, that it's all going to happen because you're a good guy and you can play well. Uh, you still got to make your way in this world, and especially in the United States. Uh, it, it's a little bit easier in some respects in Europe or in Japan or in the East. Uh, but here you've got to really work on it. You talk to Ron Blake in jazz. He's so he's Saturday Night Live now and very successful. Uh, he went through uh, good uh, background, good education, really an informed jazz musician, but it didn't come to him. He's had to work for every inch that he's been able to uh, conquer. And that's the word of wisdom, persistence, be good, practice. Uh, what other words can, can you give? Uh, be assertive and uh, make the grade because you made the grade, not somebody that somebody hands you on a silver platter. That sounds so simple to me. <laughs> okay, that's it. That's it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very much. You're very generous with your time. Yeah. Hopefully it's, right, gonna... it's gonna cost you, but <laughs> <laughs> to fish or not to fish, that is the question.